All right, so this is definitely a hard question, but we know that the SAT is, really likes this style of question all of a sudden. They, they are, they're, pretty much every practice test, every SAT seems to have one of these like quadratics where they're kind of giving you some conditions, but they're doing it in like code, and you've got to untangle this thing using a bunch of formulas or uh, plug some points in, it's just a mess. And a lot of them end this way, where it's like, what could be the value of A plus B? Meaning there's probably more than one value, but because it's multiple choice, they're kind of limiting us. So we have to kind of almost like guess and check. So uh, I will show you the way that I think the college board is going to instruct you to do it. And I think that that's a very uh, good way to go about it. But, you know, I'm going to show you another way that might make you mad. We can throw this into Desmos. We could do it by using the regression. So hopefully you've seen some of my other videos where I've talked about this. Um, I do need to make a lesson where I exclusively just teach this straight up. But basically the way it works is we make a table. We put the points in the table. So seven, zero, negative three, zero. Uh, then we design a, a regression line using the tilde and basically mimicking the equation that they, they want for us. A X squared plus B X plus C. The big thing though is it's we use Y one and X one because we want to tell Desmos to go to that table to get the points. But when we do that, we have a problem. It tells us that A is zero, B is zero, and C is zero, and we just get a flat line. So that's just because Desmos doesn't, it doesn't, it's always going to go the path of least resistance, and for it, it's, that's what it thinks, is it thinks that that's, the, that's what we wanted. But we do have a condition that we can help uh, kind of like uh, change this a little bit, right? We know that A is supposed to be an integer greater than one, so zero is not greater than one, so that's not going to work. So there might be other ways to integrate that information into our process here, but we could also just like tell it that, okay, A is, let's make it an integer greater than one. What's the, what's the obvious guess here? How about two? And suddenly this thing turns into a parabola and you can see that the values of B and C also are more specific now, negative eight and negative 42. So if we just, you know, it could be other things, right? We could have it as, as A could be three, right? Right, and it's gonna differ different values for B and C, but let's keep it simple, right? Just assume this the dumbest thing. And if we do A, plus b, we get negative six. And that's an answer. And that's the answer. So yeah, I mean, look, again, it says a has to be an integer greater than two. So if we had made it a different integer, like three, this wouldn't have worked. We wouldn't have gotten one of the answers that's there. But this is why you just assume the simplest thing and then you can always play with it from there and see what happens. Of course, you know, there's a point where we wouldn't keep trying integers until we found it, right? Like if the answer was like 17 or something, would we really count all the way up to that? Probably not. We'd really want to have the more rigorous way of solving it. Um, but yeah, sometimes stuff just works out nicely. And this is something I, I struggle with with a lot of my students who, for various reasons, they can't start a question unless they have a full plan and they know that something that they're about to do, some step they're about to, to go down, uh, they know it's going to work. But you can't approach the SAT like that, especially the hard questions, the twisted questions, because if you always need to know if something is going to work before you try it, you will hit so many dead ends. You will just kind of spend half the time on these hard questions thinking and wondering what to do when just doing it was all you needed, right? I didn't know that this was going to work out so nicely, but I did it anyway because why not? Why not see? It's better than staring at the question, right? So always try to be moving the question forward. Even if you're not sure if something's going to work, just try it. And, and maybe you'll learn something from that failure too. But yeah, I, I want to have a better way to solve this because I do think that this is, you know, not always going to work out so nicely, but, um, you know, take the win when you can get it. So let's see if we can do this without Desmos. Uh, we have to be able to read these kinds of stories in code basically and think, all right, what do I have? So maybe I could plug points into equations, but it's also helpful maybe to kind of do a quick sketch of this graph. So if we did that, we would see we have uh, x-intercepts at negative 3, 0. So here's negative 3. And here's 7, right, the other x-intercept. And since a is greater than 1, we know that this thing has to open upwards. So we can kind of think of it like that. Um, now, there are ways to plug points into equations and, and kind of get uh, putting 7, 0 and negative 3, 0 into the f of x equation and, and using that. We could do that, but it's a little bit more annoying and tedious. I prefer an equation that's going to focus exclusively on the a and the b because that's what I want in my answer, right? That it would be helpful if I got rid of the C. So if we went the if we went just the normal plug points into equations route, we'd still have that C to deal with, and that's kind of annoying. But the equation that's most useful when we just want to think about A and B is that the x coordinate of the vertex, we often call H, is equal to negative B over 2A. 
So there's the A, there's the B. So maybe that I can find some sort of relationship between them. But in order to do that, I need H. But luckily, if I know the x-intercepts, I know the H because parabolas are symmetrical on, about the vertex, right? So this distance from three, negative three to seven is 10, meaning that the, the, the vertex has to be halfway in between that. So it has to be at five. But remember, it's not five as the value of X, it's a distance of five, right? So that would mean that X, the X coordinate is two because that is five backwards from seven and five forwards from negative three gets us to two. So now we have an equation, right? So two is equal to negative B over two A. Let's just clean it up a little bit, right? So that's four A is equal to negative B. Uh, I would probably wanna get rid of B because they gave me some information about A. So I'd say, all right, let's, let's see if maybe getting rid of B helps. So let's just make it negative four A is equal to B. And now let's take this and pop it in here. Right, so that means that a minus or plus negative uh, 4a, right? So a minus 4a is what we're looking for, which we can reduce to negative 3a. So one of these choices has to give us, is equivalent to, or is a possible value of negative 3a. And maybe there are other ways to do it from here, but um, at this point, I would just be like, well, let's just try them out, right? So each of these is supposed to be a value of negative 3a. Let's just see what happens if we set it equal, right? So we know that a, choice a, is the answer. So if we set this equal to negative 3a, and we said let's solve for a, right? We would divide by negative 3, and we would get that a is equal to positive 2. Hey, that's what it was in Desmos, right? And guess what? That satisfies this condition, that a is an integer greater than 1. 2 is an integer greater than 1. So basically what we've proven here is that A is a possible value, choice A is a possible value, uh, negative 6, because it allows, it meets all of our conditions. It, uh, would, it would give us a parabola with a vertex at, at 2. It would give us a, a set of x-intercepts at negative 3 and 7. And it would, have, it would open upwards. It would have a positive uh, A uh, that's greater than 1. So it, it, it satisfies those conditions. Just to show you what, what, like what could go wrong if we did choice uh, B here, right? So negative 3 is equal to negative 3A, right? If we move, did the same move and we divided, we get A is equal to 1. But 1 does not satisfy that condition, right? 1 is not an integer greater than 1. 1 is 1, right? So that doesn't fit, right? This is the difference between the greater than and the greater than or equal to symbols, right? If we did 4, right, so negative 3a, and we divided by negative 3, well, we'd have a messy number, but more important than it being a fraction is it being a negative, right? So it has to be greater than 1, so negative isn't going to work, and the same thing's going to happen with d. So we're going to basically be able to eliminate all of these answers by showing that they violate one of our conditions. And this is very, again, this, this gets back to what I said, like some of my students have a lot of trouble uh, dealing with questions where there isn't like just a set answer, like x equals 5, right? a equals 2, right? Like they, they really need that because that's how they've been trained in school is everything has an answer. But the SAT is asking a question where there are multiple possible answers, right? There are a range of a values that are all possible. There are a range then of a plus b values that are all possible. And I'm sure we could find that full range, but that's not our task, right? Our, our task is to test whether any of these four numbers are in that range or are, are possible. So you, you have to approach this question with an open mind and the ability to kind of give up on the idea that there's a single answer, right? I mean, obviously there's one correct answer, but like mathematically, you're never gonna just have that X equals a number at the end. It's just not gonna work here. So you gotta be flexible. This is not the only question we've seen on these practice tests that behaves in this way. So I think this is something we should expect on the real test is that you're gonna have to be very clever with your quadratics. You can be clever with Desmos as well, but you're gonna have to you know, take some guesses and make some assumptions and just say, what if A were two? What if uh, I could find the vertex, right? And just kind of ask these what if questions and, and then hopefully something clicks. Um, they're very hard. Feel free to comment if you found some other clever way to do this. I am curious. Uh, like I said, I know there's another way where we just take those points, those x-intercepts and plug them right into the equation, uh, f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c, but it's a little bit more tedious and it'll actually end up in the same place. So I don't know if there's a way to do this without this kind of guess and check at the end, but there you go. You got lots of options, but the moral of the story is just try stuff. Don't Spend time on your SAT wondering if something is going to work. Test it. See if it works. Be a scientist, okay? Just do the experiment, and then if you fail, so what? You still learn something.